Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And I'm the peeved off movie reviewer. And today we're going to be uh, tackling uh, a real piece of ass, you know? Real a piece of ass 65 million years in the making. Yeah. We're doing some shit that makes the Land Before Time sequels look good. Can you believe there are 14 of those things? Um, I mean, I haven't even watched the first Land Before Time, so... No, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I think that's, that's just a really weird thing. Anyways, uh, jokes aside, my name is Pie Kiss Chris. I'm Bastard Swordsman, that's my real name. Yeah, uh, on his birth certificate. and My uh, given name. Yeah, this is Scenes from a Podcast. And, uh, you know, if you haven't read the title, uh, just letting you know we're, we're reviewing Jurassic Park. Well, not reviewing. Discussing. Sorry, I'm still in Doug Walker mode. So, before we, uh, before we start talking about, um, giant bird monsters, uh, you've been up to anything lately? Um... I can tell you one thing I haven't been up to, which is cloning dinosaurs, but um, aside from that, nothing really. Uh, just been reading some stuff. I finally finished uh, the novel Infinite Jest. I might have told you about that before. Yeah, you did. It's, I mean, hmm, like this is probably like a spoiler to say. But, so, like, the ending of the book, it, like, it basically just ends. There's not really, like, a real ending to the narrative. It's just, like, another scene, and then, boom, that's the end of the book. So it's, like, so it's not even, like a, like, a scene that wraps anything up. It's just, like, a weird vignette sort of thing. Well, it's the, the whole book is like a lot of vignettes, but yeah. Hmm. So why was that? Why was what? that disappointing? I'm sorry, I can't remember what. You what? Said. Why? Why was that disappointing? Uh, oh no, no, I I didn't think it was disappointing. It was just you know like. It might be considered disappointing for a lot of people, but I thought it was pretty all right within the context of the book. And I actually thought the book was very good. Um, it's funny. It made me actually laugh quite a bit. Um, but it also had some really like sobering emotional moments. And the character writing was pretty fantastic. Like, because... Like, one chapter, you'll get, like, one side of a character, and then, a ne like, another chapter will give you, like, another character's perspective of that character, which will give you, the reader, another whole brand new perspective of both characters. And there's a lot of, like, really great indirect characterization. And, I love, yeah. I love shit like that. We're like... It is a really slow-paced book, though. Like, insanely slow-paced. Yeah. I imagine there's a lot of switching back and forth between... There is. You know, like, retreading the same ground a lot. Uh, um, I don't know about that, but, like, it's just the plot doesn't really progress that much. You want to talk about books with plots that don't progress all that much, well, you should read my book. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> Shameless plug for a book that isn't even published yet. But no, uh, I, actually, um, I actually really do like the concept of multiple point of view characters and sort of going not back and forth so much for between perspectives, but also, like, going back and forth between, like, 
periods and like seeing how one thing led to another, you know? Yeah. I also read the newest ReZero book, which was a very different experience, but I enjoyed that. That's pretty much all I got. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Uh, I didn't do much either. Uh, I think like Tuesday or something, I saw the new Transformers film. Because everyone was like, oh my god, it's so much better than the Michael Bay films. And I'm like, okay, I'll I'll go watch it. And I think it was like the worst film I've seen this year so far. So Damn. <laughs> That's kind of funny, but I've seen some like revisionism of the old Transformers movies, like, nah, this was actually fire. <laughs> I saw this when I was 13 and I thought Optimus being a sociopath was the coolest thing ever. Okay, Zack Snyder. <laughs> Didn't Zack Snyder and Michael Bay like go to the same college dorm together? I, think I have no idea, but like I know that Zack Snyder was born in Wisconsin and I don't know where Michael Bay is from. He, he's from somewhere with a lot of with a lot of fireworks. Because the explosions. I mean, there are a lot of expi uh, fireworks everywhere. No, he was just born in L.A. <laughs> oh. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. That that makes way too much sense. But no, this movie was. Um, it, 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 oh, they they did both. They did both actually go to the Art Center College of Design. So, really? yeah, maybe I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I knew that they they like had some like shared background or something. So, them and also this third guy who made like that one exploitation movie about. Jennifer Lopez going into Vincent D'Onofrio's brain. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, it was just like... It was Osmosis just... Jones? <laughs> no, it was not Osmosis Jones. <laughs> Why do you say exploitation movie? <laughs> It, it kind of felt like an exploitation movie to me, I mean. Were there, like, animals being torn apart? Well, no, not, not like, hardcore exploitation, but more like... <laughs> like, it just had that vibe of, like, I'm gonna use, like, this very serious subject matter as a launching off point for, like, faux deep bullshit but i can't remember what the movie was called i knew it was about jennifer lopez going into the brain of a serial killer well exploitation movies aren't usually even attempting to be deep that's that's fair i don't know maybe the the definition has changed over time or maybe i'm just a dumbass i'm probably might be the latter I'm probably just a dumbass, yeah. But anyways, the Transformer thing, it, it was literally... I know I'm not rocking any waves here, but it was literally just, like, action figures smashing against each other. So, like, an MCU movie? Yeah, well, no, even worse than an MCU movie, because even MCU movies have a little bit of setup and structure with... With this film, it was just the robots, and then another robot faction shows up, and then a third robot faction shows up, and it's just, like, you have to, like, be familiar with, like, three different toy lines 
and like three different TV series surrounding. Is this. one of them Bionicle? No. Uh, one of them is Beast Wars, which is like. It's basically that they turn into animals instead of trucks. Uh, I actually thought that was a really good show, but that's not important. Here they kind of suck. And uh, yeah, the movie kind of sucks. So the I take it the robots fighting wasn't very cool. Well, I mean, it was just that, like, when you say, when the best thing you can say about a movie is that it's better than a Michael Bay movie, there's not really much to say about it, you know? I heard people saying that um, Michael Bay's last movie was pretty all right. The last movie where, like, Shia LaBeouf's ancestors were Knights of the Round Table who knew Knights of the Round Table Transformers? No. Neither of those apply. I don't even think Shia LaBeouf has been in a movie for a few years, but... No, the, the last movie that Michael Bay did was called Ambulance. Oh. Oh, I thought you meant the last Transformers movie. No, I said the m last Michael Bay movie. Okay, then. Ambulance. And Shia LaBeouf hasn't been in a Transformers movie for a while either. Yeah. But it sounds like a bunch of bullshit. Um, yeah. I, I'm not really interested in seeing it. I, I don't think I'd sway you by <laughs> telling you any of the things I told you about it, but, you know, just wanted to warn you if you, if you liked the Monsterverse movies, you're probably going to like this Transformers movie, so, yeah, go, go nuts, return to monkey. No. Well, hmm. I mean, I don't really have much to say. Uh, what about you? Uh, yeah, I think we should basically just start talking about the movie. Uh, Jurassic Park. Uh, this was my pick. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Jurassic Park is a 1993 Steven Spielberg movie about a Scottish... Uh, entrepreneur uh, making a theme park on a Costa Rican island where they clone dinosaurs and then like he has to like get experts to prove that the island won't like fall apart and then the island falls apart and they all learn a valuable lesson about not cloning dinosaurs. Jokes aside, I, th I think this movie is it's all right. Uh, well, to quote the movie itself, um, how I'd sum up this movie is, that's one big pile of shit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I think the movie's okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, I've never been like a huge Spielberg fan. Like he's really influential, but he's also influenced a lot of terrible filmmakers and films. I really do not care for the whole like big blockbuster wave that he kicked off with it was really jaws that started it but like i don't know i, I just, i'm just not really too into his characters the melodrama the one-liners like it has its place but it's not really my style but like really this feels just like an 80s movie like stuff he's he'd already been doing but like, really, the more interesting parts are the technical aspects, like, with the dinosaurs themselves, because, you know, there's a combination of very early CG and also animatronics. Yeah, I do think that the reason I picked this movie is because the impact it had and its production is... Like, it's actually more interesting than the film itself. Like, when I was a kid, I was, like, obsessed with this movie, uh, as kids tend to be. Uh, 
but uh you know as i sort of grew older i sort of thought that there there really wasn't all that much to offer here you know uh it was I, competently made uh one of my problems i that i have is that i feel like Spielberg's approach isn't really completely congruent with the story that the the film wants to tell, or I should say the book. And I haven't read the book, but from what I know, the book is basically like a horror sort of novel. Kind of. I read the book. It's more like a... It's more like a techno-thriller Uh Basically, the most of the book is, most of, like, the first half of the book is a bunch of, like, backstory. Oh, yeah. Uh, spoilers for Jurassic Park. Should have probably said that some one time. I'll say it at the beginning. Yeah. We will spoil this movie. Uh, dinosaurs eat people. Anyways, mo most of the book is about, like, going into the technicals and the politics of how the park works and operates and people's like differing opinions and philosophies on like the technology and corporate cultures and like the the ethical use of science for commercial purposes uh the other half of the book is over the top gore and violence and action scenes and yeah, uh, I don't necessarily think that it's incongruous, though. I, I feel like Spielberg does a good job establishing the tone of this film as, you know, it's, it's adapting the book, but it's not adapting the tone. It's more so just adapting the, the general plot. And uh, I personally never felt like it needed to be anything but a light-hearted, you know, uh, blockbuster with like some scary moments for for like younger viewers. But uh, for the most part, it's focused on whimsy and whatnot. Yeah. 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 Uh, like the the scene where the first dinosaur shows up is like pretty effective. Yeah, I, you know, watching it again after all these years, I actually think it's a a really good, like subversion of expectations because at the time, people nobody fucking knew what a velociraptor was. You know, nobody had ever heard yeah. of anything that wasn't a T Rex or a Stegosaurus. So you you expect like something big to come out of the the trees, and instead it's like this this crane machine that's like carrying something like really small, or at least mm -hmm. smaller than you'd expect a dinosaur to be. Well, I mean, like the uh, the first time we see a dinosaur full on, like in all of its glory. I mean. That is what I consider to be, like, the first, like, big dinosaur reveal. Oh, yeah. I d yeah. I do think... You know, uh... I'm mostly thinking about this from the perspective of other dinosaur films and other Jurassic films in general. I feel like this film, for all the shit it gets for, like outdated science still does a better job of making like like these things feel like real animals than like the sequels do because but it's not even really so much outdated science as it is just like made up bullshit from the start yeah yeah made up made up bullshit wait what do you mean made up made up bullshit i mean i i get what you mean but like 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 the um the mos like getting the dinosaur DNA from preserved mosquito blood or whatever, and then cloning dinosaurs from that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, DNA cannot survive that long. Like, I'm not a paleontologist or whatever, and even I know that. When I was talking about uh, 
outdated science. I meant like the the reconstructions, though, because people give these movies shit for having dinosaurs that don't look like what we think modern day interpretations of dinosaurs look like. But even then, well, those people are kind of just nerds. Yeah. But even then, like, they still feel more like real animals to me than, like, a lot of what we got in the later movies. Because, yeah, there's a lot of of chomp-chomp. You know, there are action scenes. But, like, a good chunk of, like, the, the scenes in this movie that have, like, tension in them don't rely on dinosaurs. They rely on environmental hazards. You know? Like trying to get out of the tree with the falling car or trying to climb up the fence before the power comes back on. And the scenes that do rely on, like, dinosaur attacks, they have, like, they're not just mindlessly biting at anything they can get their jaws on. Like, the, when the T-Rex breaks out, it's, it's actually a really cool scene because you get the sense that it's experimenting with this this world that it that it has absolutely no idea about and it's like seeing a car for the first time and just dicking around with it because why wouldn't it you know yeah i feel like i went off on a tangent there sorry i mean that's what podcasts are for yeah yeah uh I will say, even if, like, you said that this film has a lot of, like, blockbuster stuff and one-liners, and yeah, I can see that. I still think that for a blockbuster film, though, uh, the actors, Sam Neill, Laura Dern, Jeff Goldblum, Jeff Goldblum, I kept wanting to call him by the character's name, Ian Malcolm. Yeah, they they all like do a good job of giving these people idiosyncrasies that that make them feel real even if everything is like you know scripted and and I mean off. I actually really like Sam Neill and I'd consider like him this well it's definitely not one of his better he definitely has better performances than this i would say yeah that for sure i i do feel though that they that there Same is still, with laura dern. yeah yeah no laura dern was at her best in uh uh the last jedi no i'm just kidding um I don't, she, she she wasn't in the last jedi though yeah yeah she was she was the the pink-haired admiral who took I thought that, w- that was oh wait no no yeah that was the last jedi i was thinking of i was mistaking it for the rise of skywalker <laughs> oh jeez yeah night and day uh blockbusters now and blockbusters then but uh you know for you know, I sort of I've I've gone through like this arc with this movie where I've gone from being as a kid like, oh, my God, this is the coolest movie ever. A T-Rex eats a lawyer to growing up and and being like in high school and college and kind of going, you know, there are better films out there. You know, both, there, you know, Citizen Kane is m- might be better than Jurassic. Might maybe. Be. Yeah. Maybe. Let's put a pin in that, you know, debatable whether or not Orson Welles, you know, I know he reinvented cinema, but. I mean, not really, but he was really good. But anyway, we're getting off a tangent. Um, Yeah, that, that scene where the lawyer gets eaten is pretty fucked up. Like, that lawyer didn't even do anything. But he like get like dies horrifically. Well, I mean, so sadistic. <laughs> well, he 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 left the kids in the car alone, and then the kids like 
made shit worse for themselves by turning on a a night lamp for some fucking reason. W- were the kids in the book? Yes, they were. Uh, they were very. Oh. They were very different in the book. Uh, I-, I was wondering because, like, it it feels like a marketing decision to have like kids in this film almost. Yeah, and no, they no, are they they are very annoying in my opinion. Kind of, yeah. No, but in the book, uh, basically, like spoilers for the book too. Uh, John Hammond isn't a good person. You know, he he doesn't go through character development. He just wants fucking money, and he wants to like sugar up the people who are gonna give Jurassic Park a good review. So he brings his nephews over, or his grandkids over, or whatever, and and sort of hopes that they'll, like, butter up, like, the paleontologists to, to say, yeah, Jurassic Park's good, and he basically is responsible for child endangerment because of that. Uh, here, I don't know why he brings them along, because he's meant to be a more sympathetic character. Uh, he was just having his kids want to look at the cool dinosaurs. Yeah, it's... I... I feel like, like... Like there's a significant change from the book to the movie. I'm repeating myself now. Where, But it's it's because... You go from Michael Crichton's vision, which is a little bit more cynical, and then you go to Spielberg, who kind of uses it as a vehicle to to explore his own daddy issues, which he likes to do in a lot of his films, is explore daddy issues. One of the things I uh, mm. thought was missing from his... Uh, From his latest film was was Daddy Issues. Um, his uh, his latest film had a lot of daddy issues, though. Yeah, but the like, Fablemans. No, not the Fablemans. The last one I saw. Shit, I'm not keeping. West Side up. Story. Yeah, West Side Story. Mm. I'm done. I mean, the Fablemans might have had like his most like parental issues out of any of the movies he's made. But well, wasn't that like a pseudo documentary about his life or something? Not documentary, but pseudo biography. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's to be expected. But like in in Jurassic Park. Uh, but okay, so the the story in Jurassic Park, like from what I can gather, is like sort of a commentary on like the hubris of man, and also like how um like man shouldn't play god because also like greed will take over and stuff and i mean i can word it better but you get what i'm saying right yeah it's very straightforward frankenstein kind of story basically Yes. Um, I just want to say that the the fat guy who was Newman from Seinfeld is awful. Um, like, he's a comically stupid, but, like, also he's just, like, a comically, like, fat character. Like, he's always eating stuff in every scene that he's in, basically, because he's fat, and fat people are gross and bad and evil. Yeah, but you gotta you gotta give it to Arnold. He really does make the character kind of watchable. Mm. Also, he calls the dinosaur good boy, but all the dinosaurs are female, and you'd expect an employee of the of Jurassic Park to know that. That that seems kind of stupid. Well, I mean. That's that's just being pedantic. I don't yeah. Think, I don't think the dinosaur fucking cared. Doesn't even understand English. 
Shit, what point was I making? Oh, yeah. So basically, Spielberg changed the thing with the kids in the thing in the movie because he wanted to make Alan Grant hate kids when he likes kids in the book so that he could explore his daddy issues. That was totally worth bringing up again. I mean, every piece of art has a small trace of its author in yeah. it. Yeah. It's so weird, though, because that's the, that's like outside of, like, Alan Grant's the main character, and that's his main character arc. And it is so far removed from the point of the rest of the movie. You know, like, the the gap between learning to mature as a father figure so that you could take that next step in your life and in your relationship with someone who you're committed to and don't play God is... <laughs> It's kind it's kind of jarring to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh um the uh the CG in this isn't like the worst I've ever seen, which is impressive for 1993. Like I've seen worse CG come from films in the past 10 years, but well, there, there aren't even that many scenes that you cg honestly well when the big brontosaurus or stegosaurus or whatever the hell it's called shows up at the beginning there are some like cg parts yeah but of that uh i also think like again this is like a little arc i went through with jurassic park where i went from being obsessed with it to like being met about it to being like you know what maybe i should like evaluate some of the things this film got right uh with regards to the cg i remember it being a lot better when i was younger and i don't think that's entirely the case of oh i've just seen this movie so many times that i can see the flaws in the cg because with, with other films that have a lot of heavy CG use, I mean, this isn't a one-to-one -one comparison because Lord of the Rings came out much later, but Lord of the Rings CG still stands up, you know, really well today. And I think a lot of that has to do less with, with like, the, the gaps in time and more like the hardware we're showing the movies on. Like the big plasma... TV screens that if you're watching older movies with older CGI like show off like more of the plasticky tex textures of the CG that you wouldn't have seen in their original version. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is, am I like reaching when I say that? Or... I mean... I don't think films were just really made to be, like, seen on TVs as much as they are, like, nowadays. Yeah, that might be. That might be fair. Uh, what else? I do think that while we're talking about the effects, the, uh, the animatronics... definitely hold up a lot better here than they do in the in the sequels um i mean i didn't even bother well actually no i did see jurassic park 3 on tv a long time ago that is literally some of the worst animatronics that was literally what i was comparing it to in my head you know just the compare like the way the the eye of the t-rex sort of expands and contracts when it's peering into the car in this movie and the fucking theme park ride spinosaurus from that movie and it's like night and day you know mm. uh 
I'm going to be a little fanboy here and think that while there are definitely worse Jurassic Park sequels, Jurassic Park 3 is probably my least favorite out of all the films just because of, like, what an absolute pile of nothing it is. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, I don't really remember anything about it, and that might be why, but... Yeah, exactly. You... The most anyone can remember about that movie is that it had a new dinosaur, and then that's it. Had a pterodactyl. <laughs> had a pterodactyl. The cool pteranodons, you fucking jerk! Wow. That's like the first time that I actually felt that the nostalgia critic was here on the podcast. We should get Doug Walker on this podcast and see what he thinks of. And I think we could. Things, yeah. We've got a big enough base, you know, we've got like three people subscribed to my channel who are all related. <laughs> hmm. Well, as long as we're having fun. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Um, another th good thing I want to say about this movie is Jeff Goldblum is pretty cool. He's probably like, well, he doesn't really do anything, but he's probably the most memorable character in the film. He, he's like a charisma black hole, you know, that sounded a lot, that sounded a lot better in my head. <laughs> what I mean to say is that like, he's got, charisma like, sink. yeah, he's, He's got like the most, the most charisma of, of anyone in this. He's got movie. swag. Yeah. You know, he, he's a Rizzler, you know? Um, another, um, positive thing I want to say is that I really like the bit of foreshadowing with, um, when they first enter like the facility, like main part of the island. And it says, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and it has, like, the display um, dinosaurs on. And then at the end of the film, it shows, like, you know, with the T-Rex fighting the velociraptors and the flag comes, um, uh, you know, tumbling down. It's kind of like, it, it kind of, like, implicitly says, yeah, like... It's when dinosaurs roamed the earth and that time is beyond, like, and we shouldn't have, like, you know, tried to bring it back or whatever. Yeah. No. It is, it is interesting how this film, like, brought up the idea of, of cloning, you know, dinosaurs and said that's a bad idea and everyone was like, hey, maybe we should try cloning dinosaurs. I don't know. I don't, I just think that's really funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, I always felt like the uh, existence of Jurassic World and all that was kind of stupid because the whole point of the original is that cloning dinosaurs is bad and then oh, they cloned dinosaurs again and it went wrong. Again, who could have possibly seen this coming? Yeah. I will say this about Jurassic World. Uh, it's not as good as Jurassic Park, obviously. I don't feel the need to clarify that. Except in order to, like, save my skin. At the very least, out of all the Jurassic Park sequels, though, it's the only one that I think has a semi-interesting new premise. And that premise was, what if the theme park was operational and successful? And what if they started making dinosaur hybrids? Which was more than, like, the other sequels that were just like, well, we have to find a way to get Jeff Goldblum back on the island somehow. You know, it's... 
Well, there. Um, speaking of that, that, that does kind of remind me of like, you know, sort of commentary on animal testing. And this is also sort of commentary on that with like, you know, um, how we like sort of treat animals and try to like bend them to human will. But, you know they we like can't like get rid of their instincts yeah you know there's there's all these these like scandals about like zoos specifically like private zoos you know that that just like have like a a profit motive motive and whatnot and also people who own exotic pets and all that uh some i do think it's it's interesting how in this film it's mostly about they don't p portray it as like cartoonishly evil like the lost world or the jurassic world sequels do where it's it's just these it's like like Hammond isn't a bad guy like he is in the book. He's naive and he's you know morally complicated, but he's not like a mush a mustache twirler. He he doesn't get that you you get the sense that he has a connection to the animals, and so do like a lot of the other staff, like that one, like extra with with the handlebar mustache, you know the veterinarian, yeah. and uh, you you get the sense that they they care about these animals, but they don't like get that their their worlds are not compatible. And again, yeah. if you've ever like seen the the sequels. With, with like his evil British nephew who's like we're going to round up all the dinosaurs and bring them to Los Angeles <laughs> mm. Los Angeles is a dinosaur yeah. <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> saying Los Angeles made me crack up so much it's just, it's just so funny to me. I apologize to anyone who's living in Los Angeles. Uh, hopefully, I don't apologize. Hopefully, your situation improves. Hopefully, you get out of Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, literally live anywhere else. Like Jurassic Park. Yeah. Oh, go to go to Costa Rica. Uh I don't know anything about Costa Rica. So I can't Well they speak Spanish and that that's all I know. Yeah. So um Jurassic Park, um I mean, yeah, it, like, I don't know if I really have too much more to say about it. Like, it's an okay blockbuster. Like, uh, it's not my, like, kind of film, but there are good things I can say about it. Um, and there is also some stuff I don't really care about it. But is there anything else that you have to say about it? I mean, I, I was surprised when I saw this again how much I actually, like, enjoyed it. Cause, cause I know you kept saying that you didn't, you don't like the the blockbuster style of of storytelling and and dialogue and characterization, and you know that's definitely gotten worse over the years. And Spielberg has played a big role in that. I think is that Spielberg. The older I get, the more respect I have for him for being a populist director you know someone who makes films that are crowd pleasers that also have some merit to them you know uh you don't 
you don't get a lot of that anymore. You get a lot of MCU films, basically, you know. I mean, Every- pretty much just by the numbers and trying to make the most money as possible. But yeah, I, I don't know. I'm still not really a huge fan of Spielberg. I don't find his films like intellectually stimulating. I don't find like the way he boots scenes to be interesting. There's not like an interesting like language to his films. I don't know. I mean, he did use a lot of lens flare in this film for whatever reason, but. I mean, he ain't got nothing on J.J. Abrams. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, uh, other than that, I think... I think... I'm trying to summarize all my thoughts on him because... Because... Holy fucking shit, my my brain is farting right now. Like, like, obviously everything is, is very played up. In this movie. With that said, I still liked the elements as they were. You know, how how he handled them. You know, the the cast, they're very flat in terms of characterization, to the point where you could argue that like the colors of their outfits are are primarily what characterize them. You know, bright blues and pinks and blacks and whites and grays. But, uh, you know, the actors still have chemistry, you know, they still play off of each other and that helps give them a little bit of depth and there's, there's all of this like dialogue that, that implies that there's a world outside the immediate narrative, like very early on in the film, there's like this conversation. It's actually like a really nice scene that characterizes Hammond before we even see him. Where he's like, well, why isn't he here for this meeting? And they're like, well, he's seeing his daughter because she's getting a divorce. And it characterizes him as someone who's, like, caring, but also someone who's, you know, who doesn't have his priorities straight because he's prioritizing that over, like, a lawsuit over one of his workers dying. And... Uh, I mean... Those are both, like, things that you can worry that are, like, I wouldn't say either one is right or wrong. Yeah, I, I just think it's, like, a like a really interesting way to, to get across information before someone even appears on screen is, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there, you know, it's just, like, I actually enjoyed the scenes of the characters just talking to each other, you know, not even, not even just like disgusting, disgusting, (laughs) disgusting, discussing the ethics of dinosaurs and, and making this theme park, but just like, you know, just talking about stuff like Laura Dern and Sam Neill talking about why they want and don't want kids and that conversation between Nedry and, and Dogson, you know, it's all, it's all just very interesting to watch on its own. You know, it's the dialogue and, and again, the chemistry between the actors, even like a bit actors, like whoever played Dogson, who I think actually went to jail for statutory rape or something along those lines. Damn. Yeah. Uh, not the strongest note to end on when praising a film, but... I mean, typical actor shenanigans. Yeah. Um, anything, are you, anything else you have to say? Yeah. I guess what I'm just trying to say is I enjoyed... Coming back to this film, I enjoyed the character moments more than i did like the dinosaur stuff or even like the ethics about the dinosaur stuff which is very like par for the course for these kind of man should not play god sort of movies but you know it's it's really like the execution of ideas that i think make them work more so than their originality or even the nicheness of ideas so, yeah, not the best film ever made, 
not even like the best Spielberg film ever made, you know? No, I, I would also say the same. Yeah, West Side Story, his remake of that definitely blows this out of the water. But, uh, yeah, for all the bad the Spielberg blockbuster formula has done, I still think he's a good director, and I still think this is a good film. Mm. Um, I've only seen this film once before, but it was a long time ago, but... My opinion on it hasn't really changed too much. I would give it like a light six, but I would still say it's worth watching. Yeah. Uh, definitely, you know, as far as dumb dinosaur films go, you're going to get more out of this than, say, Fallen Kingdom or Dominion. Yeah, or... Um, Disney's Dinosaur. A film I literally forgot about until you brought it up. <laughs> You're welcome. Just, oh yeah, that existed. Alright, so um, anything else you want to touch on? I keep saying that. Yeah. No, I think we've, we've both uh, established our opinions on this film and said everything we could about them. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if you don't mind, I'll say what my recommendation is. Go ahead, buddy. Okay, so my recommendation for next episode is a film from 2018 starring Andrew Garfield. It's Under the Silver Lake, directed by David Robert Mitchell. All right. I feel vindicated as an Andrew Garfield stan, and uh, we'll definitely get back to you on that, and I'll go... A24 movie that I've been meaning to see. Yeah, and I'm going to go kill myself for unironically calling myself a stan. So, uh, see you next time. All right. Hopefully next time, Chris will be joining us alive, and we won't have to weekend at Bernie's at uh yeah so peace